chemical kinetics. All right, so I have this nice diagram. This one is of a famous kinetics reaction. Honestly, don't know how to pronounce the names. Um, I'd probably have to go back and look that up, but um, I did put some info and a reaction video too that you can watch it. The swirls just keep going. It's pretty cool, but it's a measurable kinetics reaction if you want to take a look at it. Uh, just wanted to introduce that, uh, kind of kind of fun to watch. You want to see some application there. So let's talk here of what we're going to try to accomplish in these set of notes. We're going to be looking at um, explaining collision theory, reviewing collision theory, how to speed up or slow down a chemical reaction by these different factors like surface area, temperature, concentration, catalyst, etc. Um, and we're going to look at potential energy diagrams and review activation energy and pathway in the potential energy diagrams. So uh, now we're going to be looking at reactions from how fast they react and the pathway that they take mechanism. How do they get there from the reactants to the products? So here, yeah, I'm just going to speed through these. So they're all on the same slide. So I talk about them together. The three points of the collision theory. Number one, you can't have a reaction unless they do not bump into each other. So they must collide. Number two, they have to collide with enough energy. They have to have a minimum amount of energy. And that energy required is called the activation energy. That threshold amount has to meet it or they'll just bounce right off and go the other direction. So if it doesn't have enough energy, even if they hit in the correct orientation, it will still just bounce off if it doesn't meet that activation energy threshold. Orientation is important too though, so like if it does have enough energy but it hits the wrong side of the molecule, well you still don't have a reaction. So you have to hit the correct side of the, of the molecule in order for bonds to break and bonds to form, or bonds to bend and rotate and other things that they do. But for the most part it's breaking and forming. So relative orientation of the reactants must allow, you know, formation of new bonds necessary to produce the new products. Must collide, must collide with enough energy, must collide with the correct orientation. Those three things have to be met in order to have a reaction. Now let's look at orientation here. I like this example. So, the green is being represented by chlorine. These are chlorines. Um, the blue is nitrogen and the red is oxygen up here. So we have the effective collision versus the ineffective collision. What you should notice as you're examining the particular model diagram here is the effective collision, the chlorine is hitting the chlorine. So right here, you're getting a bond to form and we're producing RCl2 here. Um, and what you're also going to see here at, at this point, the chlorine and the nitrogen right here, that bond has to break. So you end up over here getting your ni uh, nitrogen monoxide. The effective collision is where the chlorine hits the chlorine because that's where the bond has to form and then the bond breaks between the nitrogen and the chlorine. Down here in the ineffective collision, as you can see, our lovely chlorine is hitting the oxygen side. Well, no bond forms between the chlorine and oxygen for this, so they just bounce right off and, and do not form any bonds. So this is like a perfectly elastic collision here. They separate and go their other directions. So this is why orientation would matter in terms of being able to Break bonds, form bonds. Activation energy. Activation energy, energy required 
to initiate the chemical reaction. This is the minimum amount. And now we're going to be looking at those potential energy diagrams again, but we're looking at it from the perspective of the pathway, the activation energy, the kinetics. When we were talking about thermo, we were concerned with the energy of the reactants, the energy of the products, the, the final, the initial, the state function. We subtracted it, we got our delta H here. That's the thermo representation on these graphs. This is exothermic, meaning the products are lower, so energy is being released to the surroundings. However, now what are we really looking at? We're looking at activation energy, which is from the reactant line to the top of the hill. Now, what is the hill? It's called the activated complex or the transition state. The transition state. Transition state should tell you that things are transitioning in there. You have a lot of stuff, bond breaking, bond forming going on in this part of the hill. This is where you're going to find intermediate compounds. Compounds that aren't very stable because they're in between. Their bonds are breaking and forming or bending and rotating. That's why, as you can see, at that part of the graph, the intermediates, this pathway part, that hill part, it's at a much higher energy state on the graph, much higher potential energy. And do remember an overall underlying concept of chemistry is whether it's electrons, whether it's atoms, whether it's compounds that, you know, from bonding, all of these entities are trying to achieve a lower energy state for stability purposes. So those intermediates aren't very stable. They're at a much higher energy. And it is represented by the hill on the overall diagram there. Now, when comparing the exo to the endo, besides, you know, the delta H and its symbol here, you should also notice that the activation energy right here is usually a lot higher, which would make sense because endothermic reactions require energy. They need to absorb it in in order for it to occur. So that's one of the you know, distinguishing features is that activation energy amount is a larger threshold usually for endothermic reactions in general than exothermic reactions. So now let's look at a real life example here and how it would be represented on the potential energy diagram. So I have you draw the actual reaction on the left and the particulate model diagram on the right. You don't really need to label both, but you, you know, we're gonna go through here and label them. We have our transition state at the top of the hill with that activated complex. We have the reactant line over here. We have the product line here. Now, hopefully you can see it. If not, I'm going to write it bigger. This is two B, R, and O's. Over here, we have two and O's plus the BR2. And of course, this line, the dotted line right here to the products, this part, it will be your delta H here. And for this particular reaction, we can see the products are lower, so this one would be exothermic. Now, the activation energy right here a, up to the top of the complex, like so. What you should notice here at the top, and I'll draw it bigger over here. We have our ON, but there's dotted lines between them. With the BR there, and more dotted lines, with the BR here, more dotted lines here, and so forth. Those dotted lines, of course, are representing the fact that bonds are breaking and bonds are forming. Here, of course, those ones are breaking. This one is the forming part going on. So we have our breaking ones and our forming ones. 
in order to get the overall products over here, the 2NO, nitrogen monoxides, and the 1-bromine. So we have our uh, reactants products, the transition state, and this right here, this particular molecule in and of itself would be considered an intermediate because it's in between. I have this intermediate molecule forming at a high energy state. And over here on the right, with your potential energy showing the particular model diagram, once again, the red is going to be the oxygen, the blue is the nitrogen, and these orange ones, uh-oh, didn't like that. Ooh, hold on, put that down, oops. All right, so this one right here would be your bromine. And you see the dotted lines again here, showing the intermediate bond breaking, bond forming. And then over here, you see the two definite NO molecules, this one right here, the Br2. So two of the NOs and the Br2 as your products. Going along the lovely potential energy diagram, getting that intermediate and we have the bond breaking, bond forming idea. And the energy state, the mechanism there um, where the activation energy, the hill of those intermediates forming, bonds breaking, bonds forming. Now I do like this example as well. This one I found in the textbook from last year because it's showing too how the intermediates forming as the energy profile is going along. Here you're starting with this organic molecule where the nitrogen's in the center. But it isn't just bond breaking and bond forming, we have bending. And here, as you can see, we have rotation going on, so that's a possibility. And then the C to C bond forms there and you end up with your new product where the C happens to be in the center. So that one's a little bit of a different take on just regular bonds breaking, bonds forming, but you have bending and rotating also uh, showing there in that particular example. Now, things that increase a reaction rate. Not going to rewatch the how to get a date for the dance, but the link's in here if you want to watch that TED Ed video. I'm going to talk about the analogies. Um, you most likely watched it last year or we watched it, uh, you know, back in a different unit, I think. But let's go over them again. Things that increase the rate of reaction. Increasing temperature. So increasing temperature increases the average kinetic energy of the particles. It makes them move faster. They will hit, they will collide more. Plus at a higher temperature, if they have more kinetic energy, there are also more of them meeting that activation energy threshold because they have more energy in general. So that's another point about increasing temperature. Not only does it make it move faster, but more of them now have achieved that activation energy threshold. In the video, if you remember watching it, this is the one where they cut the class time in half where everybody has to run really quickly to class, making everybody move faster. Uh, remember the analogies with reference to the school building and stuff like that. And how to, you know, running into each other and the books coming out and all of that to get a date for the dance. Second way uh, to increase would be increasing concentration. Now there's two ways to increase concentration because remember concentration has to do with we have molarity equals moles over liters. So you could add more moles like that or you can decrease your volume to uh, manipulate concentration. So change, you can add more moles, and in the video, it was like adding more students to the school, and they were packing the hallways with students, 
And then of course the other option that they show in the video about is they, they like smushed the hallways and made them smaller, not as much space in the hallways. So that would be affecting the volume factor of the concentration. Smaller particles have greater surface area. So powdered stuff versus granular stuff versus chunky stuff. Smaller particles will have a better time of colliding and they have greater surface area. So they will react more, definitely there. The example in the video was to not travel in packs. Students shouldn't travel in packs. They need to be individually walking and have more of a chance of a collision. Adding a catalyst. Adding a catalyst lowers the activation energy. And we're going to talk a lot more detail about catalysts. Um, the example in the video was where the teacher was like the matchmaker and it's very similar to like how a catalyst works it helps orient the molecules so they're colliding in the right orientation it lowers the energy needed then and if you think back to biology some of you are also in biology right now that like the enzyme and the substrate and how they have those different shapes and let's like the lock and key and they fit that's why the enzymes really are biological catalysts and they help speed things up because they get the molecules to orient in the right direction so they can break bonds and form bonds faster. So, and, and we will touch on like the enzyme idea there um, and apply it to the biological catalysts when we get into more detail about catalysts. Now, one thing to address here, that activation energy, and you might see it represented on these Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions. This is one of those graphical analysis things that we're talking about in the review, where like you have to know what you can do with this graph here. And we use it in gas laws. They represent it in gas laws because you know the, the gas's kinetic energy, if it's at the same temperature and you have two different size gases, the smaller one's moving faster, the larger one is moving slower, so they're at the same temperature, on average, of course. Here, this one is showing you the same particular molecules, but one at higher temperature versus at lower temperature. And at lower temperature, the fraction of the molecules, there's less of them that have met that kinetic energy where it reaches the activation energy. So very few, and, and for most reactions, mo a lot of the particles do not meet that threshold for the activation energy. Um, but if you increase the temperature, as you can see, the curve flattens a little bit, but it shifts to the right. And by shifting to the right, it puts a whole lot more of the particles in having that met that threshold of the activation energy. So now, if you increase the temperature, more of the particles have the correct amount of energy so they can bond break and bond form. You can still see this whole part, like this whole part, all of this, those molecules or those um, particular compounds don't have enough energy to react. It would only be the ones that have met the threshold here. So they could ask you kinetics questions about Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and you usually see it like this where it's the same kind of compound at different temperatures or you see it as a bunch of different things at the same temperature like they could have oxygen and chlorine and bromine and other ones at the same temperature. All right, right, the differential rate law. Now we're going to start talking about rate laws describe them and show how the rate of formation equals the rate of disappearance, rate of consumption. Initial rate law determines the reactive orders and a lot of this sounds pretty much like I've never heard of this and that's probably true. We will define them and look at the order of reactants and all of that next class because that was the bell. <laughs>